Thanks for listening to the Old Pueblo New Economy podcast with Aaron Eden, Julie Bonner, and Nick Morin. Each episode, we showcase the diverse entrepreneurs and leaders driving growth in the desert we call home. I'm your host, Julie Bonner, for this creative community episode. I'm an artist, designer, and marketing director, and I'm speaking with creative entrepreneurs right here in Arizona. My goal is that you can apply some of these lessons learned into your own best practices. Let's turn up the creativity. Community Investment Corps, located in Tucson and serving Southern Arizona, empowers small business owners with knowledge and access to capital. CIC believes in economic inclusion and supports entrepreneurs and small business owners at all stages with the practical resources and education they need to thrive and turn dreams to reality. CIC is a proud founding sponsor of this podcast. Sean Parker's astrophotography showcases the sparkling sky above our distinctive desert landscape. His passion for shooting the stars, capturing lightning, and chasing a dust storm translate into amazing pieces with graphic impact. Hear how he launched his photography career and how his work was quickly published in the Smithsonian. Learn how his presence on social media has led to amazing opportunities, like shooting the Aurora Borealis in Iceland for a big brand to now leading international workshops there. Sean's an adventurer, hard worker, and reveals many tips for creative entrepreneurs and up and coming photographers. Enjoy this creative community episode with Sean Parker. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Bonner with Creative Community on Old Pueblo New Economy. And I want to introduce Sean Parker of Sean Parker Photography and Time Lapse. Welcome, Sean. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here today on this Friday. To kick things off, why don't we talk a little bit more about how you got into photography and then eventually how you started your own business and focused on that. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks again for having me. Yeah, so I've been doing photography for about 10 years now. Uh, I started taking pictures of the cosmos um, originally. Like I, uh, I stumbled into a, a local astronomy bar called Sky Bar here and uh, started taking pictures of the moon with my iPhone through the uh, telescope that they had out in the back. And ever since that that photo, I've been I've been hooked. I've been starstruck, I guess you can say. And uh, I've been taking photos of the night sky ever since. I mean, I started taking pictures of deep space objects of like like galaxies and nebulas and planets and the moon. And then I worked my way down into like the the wider field of, of of things like landscapes and incorporating the night sky that way and doing time lapses of the Milky Way and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, that's kind of how I started. Uh, just to be brief, um, I yeah, and here I am today taking pictures of everything I can that I find beautiful. So. So does that yeah. mean I should have asked you before we scheduled this interview? Does that mean you're pretty nocturnal? <laughs> oh yeah, my uh, sleep schedule is pretty wacky. <laughs> and so to get kind of the night sky images, what times do you usually head out to a location to kind of get set up and be ready? Um, it depends on the shoot. I mean, I, like I said, I do everything. So if I'm doing like, if I'm doing like a Milky Way time lapse, depending on the time of year, um, I'll go out for sunset to kind of, you know, scout my shot and get ready. Or if, if the Milky Way isn't rising until like uh, two in the morning, like in my background photo, um, we probably didn't get out there until like midnight. And then, you know, I just got it in the dark because I don't, I don't want to wait for like five hours. You know, I want to get, try and get some sleep before. Um, so yeah, I, a general shoot would be probably like 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour to like prep and scout like on the internet or at my house and then drive out 30 minutes to, to an hour to shoot or to the shoot location. And then I would set up my camera, find this hike 15 minutes or so, and then shoot for hours and then come back home and edit. So it's, it's like a full day's work. It sounds like, it sounds like it's a full day's work, but it's pretty close to it. Yeah. yeah, no, it sounds like it. And then are you pretty good about kind of right when you get back to, that's when you go into the editing process or do you wait a little or you do it right then? <laughs> I try not to because I know, I know that I'm going to be up for another extra hour or two editing if I stay up. Um, but I'm always so anxious and, you know, I want to see what, what I got. And so I'll try to like dump the memory cards and try to pull the file and do a quick edit just to see how it turned out. Um, but then that usually turns into me sitting down and try to post it for the sunrise <laughs> people, you know, who are, get, who are just getting up and, um, 
yeah so it, it just depends if i'm like totally pooped i'll just go to bed yeah so. Um, but that's probably the, is that, yeah, it is crazy, especially I'm like in bed by 10 nowadays. So I'm like, what? (laughs) Nighttime? What are you talking about? But also I'm sure then that's really the rewarding part is once you get to go back and you're not looking through like a little area on your camera or whatever of like, I think I got it or, yeah. and it's probably really more exciting than once you're going through and, and I could see how that'd help give energy though, to want to like, it's hard being a creative and just like putting it over there. Like you want to kind of go into it. Yeah. That. Yeah, exactly. And but I'm, I'm actually kind of mad at that too. I, sometimes I won't touch the photos for, excuse me, like weeks or months even. So I try to get to it right away if that's, I can. That's a good, it sounds like a good process. How did you go from, I know you had a little bit of background in like in IT and some technical things. And then what, for anyone that like wants to start their own business, what made you finally decide I want to be a photo like have my own photography business? Like how did you make that leap? And was it scary or like did you work into it gradually? Um, you know, I I started I've been playing with computers since I was young. Like I think I even helped my dad start his or build his first computer or at least set it up out of the box. I've always been really electronic savvy, I guess you could say. And um my whole life I grew up playing on my computer, playing video games, downloading music, um, creating, you know, like playlists on CDs or mixtapes or whatever. Yep. <laughs> and um, so I always was interested in computers and good with electronics. So I went to some school in Prescott after, after high school to uh, Yamapai College. And I just found really good like IT jobs. And so I never finished school, thank God, because I wouldn't, <laughs> I'd be in debt with, and uh, doing what I, you know, passionate about yeah um so i moved to tucson and i found more it jobs down here and just more opportunity and i found my art side as well so um when i was working at a local computer store here um i i that's when i went into that bar and i took that first photo and then i just started like spending all my free time taking pictures of 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 the cosmos like i'd come in all red-eyed the next morning or not even sleep sometimes and come into work and um, once I started getting, you know, published and notif- or noticed for my work, I, uh, I, st- I made that, that leap, that crazy leap. Um, my boss and I both agreed that I'm not, I'm not really interested in working there anymore. So um, I uh, just, I got my first publication in Smithsonian, like probably like eight months after my first Astro photo, which That's is amazing. crazy. Yeah. And um, I, Ever since that, I, w- I was like, you know what, this is really fun. And, you know, I, I started reflecting on my, on my like teen years. And I was like, you know what, I was actually kind of taking pictures this whole time. Like I had like a Motorola flip phone, like the B3 Razor. Yeah. <laughs> and I was always taking pictures of just my friends on bikes or out on my adventures or something. And once I took that first photo at Sky Bar, it just kind of clicked. And um, I started, you know, selling prints or, and then I started getting like, people ask me, how do I do this? How do I do this? So I was like, you know what? I can take you out there for a hundred dollars and teach you, you know, that's a good, day. that's a day's work right there. And so I was like, you know what? I'm actually making money. Um, I'm probably making like enough to pay my bills at the time, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't, this could be, this could turn into something like, you know, workshops, I didn't know were a thing back then. And maybe they were just starting like, you know, like 10 years ago or whatever, but mm-hmm. um, I just started making money and um, I was like, you know, I can do my own boss. I can have fun. I can travel. Like I'm like 25 at this, at this time. And I'm like, wow. Like, um, so I quit my desk job probably five years ago. I'm 33 now. Um, just turned 33 and I haven't looked back. So that's awesome. I, before starting my graphic design business, when I was just t- totally doing my own, I remember the night before, I was going to tell, I was working as an art director and I was going to tell them that I was going to leave and have my own business. And I I remember not sleeping (laughs) and I kept reading this book. I think it's like something about the creativity of a business or something. I kept rereading certain chapters, like trying to pump myself up and um, it can be super nerve wracking, but what's great in your story is sounds like you had some early success uh, getting mm-hmm. published with the Smithsonian. How did they find your work? Did you pitch them your photo or were they following you on social or how did that happen? 
Yeah, I would give a lot of credit to Facebook, honestly, like back in the day, because um, they didn't have what they have now, like the algorithms and the limited reach and the paid to paid to view or whatever it's called. Um, so I was just posting on Facebook and uh, one of the editors came across it and uh, they used it for a uh, Neil Armstrong article, like one of his wow. like the anniversary of his deaths or something, or, or when he passed away, I can't remember what it was. And it, yeah, that's, that's what, that's the, that was the, like the tipping point right there. I was like, okay, I'm getting published in Smithsonian. I've only been doing this for a few months. Um, I'm pretty excited. So yeah. And uh, what a brand booster, um, like for any business, when you get recognized by a, a larger, you know, big brand, how you can yeah. make sure you mention that in all of your, you know, future materials and yeah, I still have that magazine too. I should have had it ready. Oh, um, cool. But... <laughs> well, um, yeah, we can it. post a link to it too in the write up. Yeah. I'll, I'll send like the, uh, like the scan cover and, and the pages. That'd be cool. Uh, so then you, then you made the leap and I know like, for example, you mentioned, actually, let's talk about, you brought up workshops, how quickly then you're taking photos yourself. How quickly then did you also realize the part about giving workshops to others? Um, you know, that didn't come very quickly. That was probably like a year and a half ago, like after, okay. um, you know, I, I spent, I had, I, my dad always taught me to save money when I was growing up and I had a good savings at the time to kind of make that, that risk, you know, and, um, I probably didn't start making like decent money for like a year or maybe two. And, um, so I would say like the workshops where they are, where they're at now, I would never imagine. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm leading international workshops, not just like in Tucson. So, uh, yeah, it took, it took a little bit, but you know, it's, it's, it's been great. Yeah. So, sounds like you're combining all your passions. So can you tell us more about your, your Iceland uh, trip that you take? Yeah. So I go to Iceland once a year now. Um, I've been going there for a few years. I think this will be my upcoming like 11th, 10th or 11th time over there, which is pretty exciting. Um, uh, yeah, it's just that country is amazing. And it's probably my favorite um, country to travel in, but probably because I'm biased because I've been there so many times and it's just so easy and beautiful and for, it's a photographer's paradise. I mean, there's black sand beaches, there's glaciers, there's waterfalls, there's the Aurora Borealis, there's amazing food. You know, it's just like, it's so fun and I wouldn't say easy, but it's just like the culture and the people and the, the sites are just incredible. Um, but yeah, we do, uh, one, I do one, I lead one workshop there with a local, uh, Thor photography. What's up Thor? <laughs> um, <laughs> he, him and I run, uh, like a 10 day workshop where we just travel around the South coast and the, some of the West coast. And then, um, I usually have my own clients. Um, well, we bring our, we bring both our clients into one, you know, but then I have some private people who want to just do like more one-on-one -on -one, and I'll do a couple, like a few days of those. Um, I've also had clients who have taken Thor workshop with me and they wanted to extend that they wanted to do like a 14 or 15 days. So I'll, they'll stay a couple extra days and, and just travel with me. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of fun. We're up all night shooting the Aurora. If there is Aurora, uh, Iceland can be tricky with that, with the clouds because it's an mm -hmm. Island and it's in the Arctic. So, um, then we get up for sunrise, which is around nine o'clock. So it's perfect for our sleeping schedules. Uh, you know, we don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning like you do here or five yeah. and and then we just travel and just shoot shoot the light you know because the, the light there is incredible because the sun doesn't really go all the way up in the sky because it's always kind of near the horizon or like 30 to 40 50 degrees so mm -hmm. just magical yeah I, I don't know if you can tell but yeah i'm getting really excited <laughs> if you look at sean's site and he shows what workshops he offers and then he has photos and images from your trip and i just think to me, that's kind of like a dream situation, like, you know, help, helping other people and doing something you love and being in a beautiful place. And then it sounds like you're very comfortable there. Now you've been there many years. So you have this kind right. of e ease of doing it and feel like you got things under control and yeah, definitely planned out. That's awesome. I mean, I have friends there. I have like, <laughs> like a handful of friends that I met over the, over the years through Thor or through this production that I've worked on out there and when I go out there they they host me we go out for drinks get dinner and um, some of the hotels are even starting to know who I am so like wow. <laughs> I get a little discount here and there and um, 
yeah, and we, it's just a fun time, you know, you're in like a bus, like a short like party bus, I guess, with, with you know, nine other photographers and every, you know, those new friends, new uh, memories, just, yeah, just new experiences. And, you know, Iceland is just so, you know, it's easy to get around there because they speak English and the food is just so good. It's just incredible. Wow. What, wait, what's your favorite? So I don't really know about the food there. What's your favorite kind of di local dish that they have? Um, they have a lot of great fish. Uh, I like the cod there. And then um, they also have lamb shanks, which are like the bomb.com. They're so good. <laughs> um, and then just like the, the soup. Oh my gosh. Like coming, coming in after like a day of being out in the snow or in the cold and just having the homemade soup and the bread. Oh, it's so good. And the salads, the vegetables are just like fresh from the backyard. Like it's just so good. Yeah. It sounds awesome. Now I'm getting hungry. It's almost lunchtime. So <laughs> I know it's almost there. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you love traveling and then you also, and obviously being outside and then let's talk about mm -hmm. the storm chasing aspects okay. of your work. How did you like, have you been doing that for a long time? how did you start chasing storms and, and documenting? Um, you know, when I was still learning photography, I, uh, had like a Canon T3i, that was my first camera. And I was just trying to learn everything. Like, you know, when I couldn't shoot the stars, I would set up my camera, like in my door, like, and then shoot out like in my like backyard to try and get lightning. So I was just experimenting with everything like HDR, lightning, landscapes. And, you know, I, I've been shooting lightning, like, I guess like not professionally, but like as a certified storm spotter. And I know you wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I've been probably doing that for a few years now. Um, and I think I started getting good at lightning back in 2015 or 16. Um, I think I would say 2016. Uh, so yeah, just, I don't know, just understanding radar and, and the forecast and, you know, I can, I know how to position myself in the right spots usually and safely as well. What's your go-to app that you use? Like I have my radar on my phone. Is that pretty good or are there other ones that are even better? Uh, my radar is good. I like my radar actually because it has like the whole like map interface built in. But I use a app called Radar Scope. Um, it's much more detailed and advanced, I guess, than my radar. Um, and I also like it because it has the Storm Spotter network built in, so you can see where your friends are at, and you can um, actually like uh, what do you call it? You can report like a tornado, or you can report like oh. a ball cloud, or yeah, and it detects. CGs, which is what's what they call cloud to ground lightning strikes. So, um, you know, it's like right up to date. It's like, yeah, it's super up to date and it, you, you can pick different networks to, to use data from. So. so it's like a social media aspect too of like for all of you that are like looking to get connected to the storm. Kind of, kind of. It's more like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have like the photography side of it, but it has like, yeah, you can see that, oh, this person's here. And then it has their contact info if you want to like, call them or email say hey how are things over there or like the national weather service can use that information and call them to be like hey can you give us more information about what you just reported stuff like that so oh. it's more i would say a more like legitimate <laughs> um professional um aspect of it but a lot of people just get it just to see where the good where the good guys are at so they can just like, follow them but oh. um I use it for just to see where lightning's at, see um, history, and just look at all kinds of different levels or of um, of different uh, readings. So, yeah. And so you, I've seen in other interviews, you love lightning. Is that like one of your favorite things to capture? No, it's not my favorite, but it's definitely the most exhilarating, I would say. Um, it's super hard. It's probably the most challenging thing to photograph. Um, I, I think my favorite is like the aurora borealis or astronomy all the way, but mm. um, shooting lightning and getting that full, you know, you just get that energy and um, excitement that you can't really, that you don't really get from shooting anything else. So, Have you ever had any close calls? Or are you pretty usually farther <laughs> away? <laughs> Wait, tell me. <laughs> uh, I was just, uh, I was thinking about this one the other day that was like, probably like a half a mile from me or something and it was just so close and loud it, it dropped me to my knees I was so scared <laughs> I was Yikes. like all right packing up let's go <laughs> yeah you're, you're like but am it, I near any tall things or like <laughs> yeah yeah I usually like if I'm in a bad area I'll just jump in my car because you're usually pretty safe in your car um, and leave the camera out but 
Um, yeah, it's happened a few times. So I learned my lesson a few times and I, I still take my, my chances, but yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. We had that once during a hike on top of Mount Lemon and out of nowhere, a storm came and it was like one of those where I think it was really right above us. And it was just so crazy. Same thing. I just dropped down. Like I was in a war zone or something like, <laughs> and then I was like, what do we do? Because there's just trees and I'm on top of a mountain. Like, and, and you, you learn, like, I think you're not supposed to be under trees. Like, yeah, anything tall, you're not supposed to be around. Yeah, so I'm like, um, I don't know what to do here. Need an expert. And I'm like tall. You. What'd you yeah. say? And, I, and I'm tall, so when I'm out there in the middle of nowhere, I'm like, shit. Yeah, you're like, oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, language. you're fine. Oh, you're totally fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then how did you become, I guess, a certified, like, do you have to go through classes or what do you do, do to be more like certified? storm is it storm chasers the right term or? storm chaser yeah, yeah yeah certified spotter uh, there's a spotter network um they give you a test and um i can't, I can't remember if it's free or not I've, I've had it for so long i should probably retake it anyways just to refresh my memory but yeah you take a test online and then um you get like two chances i think and um then you have to wait like a couple weeks to take it again or 30 days um, so for that network which is on radar scope um there's a test for that and then the National Weather Service has a certified storm spotter network as well. And then it's just, yeah, it's just classes and um, taking a test. So yeah, you don't have to go to any kind of special school or anything. That's pretty cool. But, yeah. Do, it's not, uh, I don't yeah. know. It, it, it is, it is cool, but it's not like, it's not like a brag. It, maybe it's a bragging right to some people, but for me, it's just like, I just want to know what I'm doing and, and report like, you know, accurate stuff. So right it's not like it's not like a diploma or degree or like that, you know? <laughs> yeah but i think i you know what it shows though is um you definitely seem like the type that likes to learn and um make sure like you you understand your equipment and how to look at the sky and and all those things so i think that's just so important that's how you grow in your business and in your expert mm -hmm. expert arena i guess yeah, um, i'm constantly learning yeah. I, and I tell my, my clients, like, you know, I'm, I'm teaching you what I've learned and, um, you know, you, like, just, just know that I'm probably gonna learn something from you this trip as well. So that's what I love about, you know, workshops and, and my type of uh, business is where edu education, it's great. You know, nothing like, yeah. you know, keeping those juices flowing. So, yeah. yeah. And did you have any kind of, I guess, photography mentors or even just books or podcasts or anything that you would listen to when you were kind of learning a lot? Um, Google University. <laughs> I, <laughs> I learned a lot online um, and just from trial and error. I mean, that's, I think that's what um, sets me apart from a lot of these, a lot of these other guys is that I have so much time and experience with this um, and a lot of failures too that I've learned from and, you know, I wish I took a workshop when I was learning because I would have saved a lot of time. But at the same time, I'm glad I went through those those steps to be where I'm at. Yeah. So you like you make a mistake and it was blurry and it didn't turn out and you're like, oh, I won't do that again. And exactly, I can't tell you how many times that's that's happened. Oh, I'm sure that's hard though with your night night photo like night you know sky astrophotography, um, having things come in crisp and and. And then also, so you do time lapse work, and I just watched the one recently of that Haboob and where was that one? You oh yeah, uh, Gila Bend or some. Or yeah, Gila Bend. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It that started was, um, near yeah. like Casa Grande, and then it moved all the way to uh, Gila Bend. I think it even reached like almost to Yuma. You know, it, it happens a couple times a year or a couple times every other year. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you saw my one from 2017, but it was pretty much just a repeat of that. Oh, so. um, and then how, so did you know for that one, like that day of that, that was coming or how did that happen? Kind of. Yeah. Like we knew that there's going to be some strong winds coming in and some, some severe storms that are developing. And that just, that's just a recipe in that area because there's just so much open, open desert and sand or dirt, I should say. And if, when those start kicking up and those downpours start coming down, they're so powerful and it creates this outflow boundary that just picks up dust and dust and then it eventually just creates this wall. It was a few thousand feet high, like 3,000 feet high, oh, 60 miles wide and moving like, you know, 50 miles an hour down towards the west. So it's like, you know, I don't know if you saw the, the movie The Mummy like years and years and years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's just, it's just like that where like, 
just a huge sandstorm, a big wall of dust, which is called a haboob in Arabic. And there's a lot of controversy about that, but it's it's a legitimate word. And um, it's it's what they call a large wall of dust. A dust, you know, it's more than a dust storm. It's just a large wall of dust. Large wall of dust. And I'm sure it's intimidating. So I saw you had different angles and different shots. How did you do that with something that's so big and fast and... Well, there's only one one major road out there, and that's the Interstate uh, 10 or the 8. I think it was on the 10, yeah, the 10. And basically, once you're in front of it, you just pull out, take step a, a shot until it reaches you, jump back in the car, and just keep going. And it's it's pretty fun because there's a lot of chasers too. So anyone that's in front of it are usually the chasers. So I think we had like 15 people that were pull out, set up. We'd all like talk from, excuse me, from afar and wave at each other, and then jump back in the car and it's just like that movie uh twister you know when they're all chasing yeah. storms and um yeah it's really fun and, and then sunset hits and it starts getting really pink and then it, you can see it dying down you know and then um everyone kind of heads back home where they keep chasing and shoot lightning um i probably didn't get home until like midnight that that day and i was out shooting from like three o'clock in the afternoon so wow yeah and so the storm so how far i guess did you chase it from like up near heel bend to where like, um, I didn't go further than Kila Bend. I kind of gave up on it because it was fizzling out. Um, but some other people did, and they got like a really cool shot with the, like the Milky Way above oh. the Haboob, and I was kind of kicking myself in the butt for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started in Tucson, and then I ended up in um, Red Rocks near Picacho Peak. Yep. I went down Park Links Road, and I was out there chasing like when it started getting really severe. And um, then I bolted back to Picacho, jumped on the Interstate 10 and just bolted north and then I went west and um, that's kind of as far as I went was Gila Bend and then I stayed out there for a little bit trying to shoot some lightning and then mm -hmm. I, I was just like I'm so tired my eyes are like so dried out and stuff and um, I'll send you a picture of like I usually wear the, like these goggles so I okay. can like, see and during the day and uh, um, yeah so then I was just like I'm tired I'm going home got some caffeine and then just drove home so videos basically but edited with like music and and do you like doing those more than your kind of still photography or equal or there's a lot more work um i i started doing less time lapse than i than i was i have like terabytes and terabytes of of footage that i haven't even touched yet it's just like you know putting them all together finding the right song and spending the time to edit it and post it it's just sometimes it's not as much as i want to put it out for for me um you know i gotta i gotta financially provide for myself too so if i if i get stuff that's not going to make money now nowadays it's hard it's hard not to it's hard to spend time on something that's that might not bring you anything because i should be focusing more on other things that will bring me money so yeah the business side the business side of things kind of complicates my passion so yeah well, and it's smart that you you understand like the time commitment when you're doing multimedia and I'm mm -hmm. teaching myself premiere right now just to do these interviews and I barely know what I'm doing. I'm just, you know, doing some simple <laughs> edits, but um, it can be overwhelming looking at all the options that you have and, you know, the software. But one of the times that it worked out well is you had a time lapse in the movie. I wrote it down. Bad Batch. The Bad Batch. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that happen? Um, I got an email from one of the post uh, advisors for that movie uh, from Anna Pirna Films. Um, he was referred to me by Chris Antonini. Um, and he was like, hey, like we, I was referred to you by Chris and we really like your work. Um, I'm working on a film with uh, Lily Anna Pirna and uh, she's a great director. She's done a lot of stuff like The Girl That Walks Alone at Night and um, uh, Dragon, something I can't remember her other one that was famous. Um, but yeah, she she's interested in seeing some clips. Can you send over some things? Um, we're looking for uh, some like deserted um, landscapes with the stars for this for this one scene, and we we needed like ninety seconds of footage. I'm like, holy crap! Like that's that's a lot of that's a lot of clips because for time lapse, you know, like one hour is usually about like four or five seconds. Wow. Of footage. Wow. So they needed a bunch of clips and um, some they wanted and then they end up like I sent up some like a bunch of clips that I because that I, you know they they're on an NDA so they can't even tell me what like who's in it or like what's happening in that scene but they said basically 
Uh, we need something that looks like that's kind of um, like like a hallucinogenic vibe. Like oh. you know, someone might be someone someone might be hallucinating and looking at the stars. I'm like, okay, so they probably want something with more sky in it and like no city lights, stuff like that. So I sent them a bunch of stuff over. They licensed like half of that, and they're like, you can you go shoot more stuff like this, but and they give me more specifics. So um, it came down to like uh, them sending me an email and enjoying my work and then you know talking back and forth with the director and um yeah it was actually one of the coolest projects I've worked on um and I was really excited because like once I learned more about the, the movie and like the cast and and who like and seeing it on on the big screen it was like so fulfilling and like so like I felt so accomplished and successful because I was like yeah it's my first Hollywood film and I remember telling my mom like or she she told me that she's I'm gonna see you in the movies one day, Sean. And hmm. um, yeah, it was great. So uh, yeah, it was a great great experience, and I can't believe they found me in that, and they found me through Instagram. So wow, or through, um, through Chris's yeah but yeah through Instagram and Chris Chris's referral. So um, that's so exciting, and I'm sure even just the process of the a new process of dealing with someone that's making a movie and there's the mystique of you're not really sure where it's going and you're getting maybe yeah. a little bit of guidance as you go and seeing your work, you know, up in a new format uh, for all to enjoy. It's probably yeah. epic. <laughs> it was. I, uh, The Loft actually aired it and I had like a little like like party like for, I, I had like 10 friends come with me. We all watched it. Um, that is cool. And if, if anyone wants to watch it, it's on Netflix still. I think it'll always be on Netflix. Oh. But um, it, it's about, um, I'll just, like, like some Mad Max kind of vibe. Mad Max meets, like, not Saw, but, like, one of those, like, desert, like, horror films. Um, it's a really interesting watch. Uh, you know, don't watch it with the kids. Yeah, okay, <laughs> um, thanks. <laughs> but, yeah, like, Jason Momoa is in it. Keanu Reeves, Jim wow. Carrey, which you won't even recognize. Uh uh, Giobasti Rabini is in it. Um, uh, who else? Suki Waterhouse, who's like the main character. Uh, who else? There's one more. I'm forgetting somebody. But yeah, so wow. they're in it, and it. And my clips are at, like at the 55 minute mark. If you can't make it through the movie, um, at 90 seconds or 55 minutes, you'll see about 90 or about three minutes of. The footage so. wow and during the footage i guess is there um is it like voiceover or is it like music or something like you'll have to see <laughs> i have to see it okay i'll see it yeah. i'm like a wuss about yeah. sc sc scary movies so uh it's not really scary okay. it's just like i don't know it's, it's hard to say it's like a it's just it's a different kind of movie it's a yeah. different kind of movie okay cool that's yeah. really cool that the like you got to have a party at the loft and uh and screen it there that's cool yeah, we screened it. Um, they gave me the poster, and uh, I have it still. And I, I'm actually in contact with the director, Lily, and she's like, "Send, send me the poster. I'll get everyone to sign it." But um, she like she disabled her Instagram, so I'm like, "How do I get? How do I oh. take her up on that offer still?" Oh, that would but, be cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So now, um, you have the mix. Like now, we're like up to speed here, and you have the mix of you know your photography, the time lapse the workshops, selling your work, like prints and things of your work, and you do it directly through your website. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how has that process been? Um, and what seems to be, I guess, some best sellers as far as mediums since um, you offered like different sizes and is there anything that people mm -hmm. tend to choose more often? So I sell through my website through a, a platform called Smug Mug, which is a photographer's like um, e-commerce website. It's really easy to design. They give you like templates, plat, um, um, what do you call it? templates and an e-commerce store. And they take like a small cut, but you can direct, you can connect your, um, your work through any kind of print lab. So I use Bay Photo for my work because I think they're the best. Um, and it's so easy. Like people can click on a photo, they click buy, they can buy any kind of medium like canvas, paper print, aluminum metal, puzzles, like even coasters, like koozie cups, like all kinds of like oh. swag, I guess you can call it. And um, 
it's super easy. Uh, and if you guys can go to my website and sign up through my affiliate link, you'll get like 30, 30 days free and like 20% off. And then they, they give me a little kickback too. Um, oh, that's cool. So they make it really easy to sell your work and have a really pretty website. And that's what I'm using now. I am in the process of, of getting something a little bit more um, advanced for workshops because I wouldn't say that their, their websites are good for, for, um, for that. You know, but they're good for everything else, like uh, client login, gallery, stuff like that. So I'm going to add like a, a separate portion to, to this mug mug and it. They do a good job and they have a whole team that kind of helps you integrate custom HTML and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so I like to sell uh, through there and it, my, probably my biggest and my most favorite sales are, are the aluminum metal prints. Um, they are just, I don't have, I can't see if I have a big metal print right behind me and it's okay. just so easy to hang and it's guaranteed for life as long as it's not outside. Um, you just clean it with like Windex and a paper towel or, or a rag or something. And um, it's, it's just so pretty and it's so eye catching and it's easy to hang and just put a nail on the wall and then that's it. Um, but they're pricey, you know, but they're, you know, it's something that you're gonna have for the rest of your life. So it's an yeah. investment for sure. And I think I saw one probably at that party we were at and how just it showcases your work like so well it's just such a beautiful kind of way to see your it almost feels like your artwork or photography is like popping out um it does mm -hmm. which is perfect and so that's pretty cool so from a resource perspective the website so basically they're handling the fulfillment too so someone orders a print you don't have to do that yourself no it, i don't have to touch it it's nice um you know unless someone wants it signed uh, then I will have to do like a custom order or I'll upload a like e on, on the, on the, on the file. Mm -hmm. Or another thing you can do is if it's local, have it shipped to me, I'll sign it, then meet, meet up with you and, and deliver it. So that's really cool. I think yeah. that lets you focus on the thing that you love and mm -hmm. not so much on the printing and producing and fulfillment and shipping and it's so easy. And that's why they take their, like, I think it's 20 or 30% cut, which is totally fine with me. I just, you know, up the prices a little bit more to, to, um, counter that. And then, um, yeah, if, if there's a problem with it, they guarantee it as well. So they will reprint it and, and cover the cost. So it's like, you know, it's so much time out of my, out of, or I have so much more time now to actually work on my photos than fulfilling the order. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then you mentioned, so you're working on another section for your workshops. What are you trying to accomplish like in this new section on your site that will make things, certain things easier? Yeah. Cause basically right now everything is signed. When you sign up for a workshop, it takes you to a platform called reg Fox, which is they organize events and stuff like that. I used to do PayPal and it's just like, I don't like, it's just not very intuitive and it's not, um, you can't, embed it into the site so you have to when you click on it it goes to a different website and that can throw people off um, so i'm trying to find something that can you know integrate into it so i might be going to squarespace mm -hmm. and then still keep these mug mug for my fulfillments and my, my ordering so that's good you're thinking yeah. about the customer and like how their user experience would be kind of the exactly. best and kind of seamless which is which is nice what has been one of your favorite, I guess, projects in these almost 10 years that you've done? Um, the Bad Batch one was pretty cool. Um, but I think my all time favorite is when I was hired by LG to go to Iceland and film the Northern Lights for their televisions. I think that was like probably like my biggest paycheck as well as like the best experience of my, of my career and even my life, to be honest. Um, I've worked on a lot of cool projects, but that one probably tops the list because, you know, it all started with them finding me on Instagram, sending me a message saying, we like your work. Um, you know, you have really vibrant colors, you have contrasty images, and that's kind of how our new OLED televisions, like the principle behind our new OLED televisions. And can we send you a TV and can we just get your feedback on it? Like, yes, please. Like. Yeah, overnight it. I'll, yeah, uh, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> and um, I got the TV, and it's it's a it's a 55 inch 
standard LED TV, and this TV is like worth like five thousand wow. dollars at the time. It, at the time, it was yeah. Yeah. And it's still great, but um, I was like, holy crap! I did not know this TV because it hasn't been released yet. It was like a, it was, yeah, it was like, uh, like I had to sign an NDA and everything. Well, like bait, you're so, like beta tester here, checking yeah, stuff out. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, I put my work on it, and they're like, hey, like. Um, would you be interested in working on a project with us for the uh, for the announcement and like the release of it? Um, how would you like to go? Um, we see that you do a lot of time lapse and stuff. Have you ever photographed the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights? And I'm like, no, but that's been on my list. Like, well, we have an idea to maybe send you up there to Alaska and film the Northern Lights with, with you and like a small team. Like, that are you are you interested? And I'm like, yes, that'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, at this time, I think this was like December or January, and there's a trade show in Vegas called CES, Consumer Electronics uh, yeah, Show. I've heard of that. Something like that. Mm-hmm. And they were like, "This well, we're going to announce the, the TV like around then. Like we're going to get, you know, have a big, big wall of these TVs for people to look at. Um, let's fly you out and we'll uh, we'll work on the logistics and we'll meet you. And they're like from South, uh, yeah, South Korea. I almost said North Korea. They're from South Korea in Seoul. And, um, so they they flew out from Seoul for the show, and they flew me out. And they had this project that was supposed to be me and like a few people turned into me and like thirty to fifty like film crew and stuff. So I met like all these influencers from YouTube. So like we're we're this is probably gonna be our, our highest budget um, project for t- for TV ever. And we want you to be the photographer. And we have this YouTuber guy who like unboxes things and reviews TVs and just this whole team and they they made a short film about it and they uh they set up this huge concert and they set up like 30 televisions and they displayed my work behind all these like local famous musician bands was this at the ces show like this was at the the show they did that no no this was at um i'm sorry i kind of jumped the gun on that one okay Uh, this this was later on in the year after i already started filming there okay um in in this um um, big music hall in Iceland. Uh, in, in Vegas, the, the following year, they set up the wall with all my work on it too. But mm-hmm. the, the wall that they set up for the show where they met me was just like, just generic basic footage stuff. So we talked, we talked about the project in Vegas to film for the next year's release. So, yeah. Wow. Was- That's epic. How did you even, did they come to you and say we're, we'll pay you this much to do this or did they say we we're thinking about do this how doing this how much would you charge did they ask you yeah how did yeah, you even this, come up with what that would entail um that was hard uh i had to ask a lot of friends and like a lot of friends in the industry that, that i'm part of a group on um i was like guys like this is a really big project but you need to be charging this because like i felt like uh like these guys are like big shots like these guys have done hollywood stuff like i have done before or or before I even got the Holly or the Bad Batch gig, yeah. Um, and like, make sure you get a lawyer to look it over. And um, he's like, I have an agent in, in California that I can connect you with, and he can go over it and and negotiate for you. And he he didn't negotiate for me, but he looked over like the paperwork and said that um, this is what I would ask. And if you if they give you any trouble, then I can then I can represent you. Um, and they didn't, I, I was like, holy crap, I cannot believe they disagreed to this number. And I'm like, I don't deserve this. Like, I'm not worthy, <laughs> but I, I was, and I am. And yeah, I, I gave them some the best footage that they ever got and they were super happy. And, um, yeah, they flew me out first class. I flew out there three times to film. Um, and I met the, like one of the VPs like out there and, it was it was such an incredible experience. I was like, all right, I made it. I think I made it. <laughs> that's so. awesome. And I think that's such a good tip. I think it's always hard um, coming up with costs, especially for unique and special projects, something you've never mm-hmm. really done before. And I think that's cool how you reached out to your network of people that might have some experience or like connect you to the specific lawyer um, just to help give guidance on kind of the unknown and uh, I know it seems like the photography industry too is is supportive. Do you feel like that? In Tucson? Yeah. Or in, or in general? Oh, or at least in Tucson. Yeah, in Tucson, I would say they're pretty. It's pretty. It's a tight community here. I feel like we have a lot of supporting people. Um, 
but for like for that last gig i had to go to the, the guys in la to you know because i don't think anyone in tucson has, has worked on a project that big so at least i that i know of because I, I asked some friends here like do you know anyone that has worked on like big productions like this They're like no so um yeah i think tucson has a great community for for support for other things like smaller things but um not for <laughs> large like stuff like that that's that's when that's when i went to the la guys the hollywood guys so. that's smart i i actually feel like a parallel between one of the episodes i've done recently is another friend of mine nick duarte and he's from tucson but he does a lot of work um in la and in other places and stuff and i i think there's a lot of similarities between you. I don't, I don't know if you've met him before. Um, the name sounds familiar, but I don't know yeah. if I've met him. Yeah, he's a super nice guy. And so we brought up like supportive and stuff. So how actually, how do you think Tucson is supportive of you as a photographer? Oh, I owe Tucson a big, a big deal of my success. I mean, like they, I found my, I found my art side here in Tucson. So I think um, just, there's just so much talent here. Um, I think everyone has been so supportive. Like I had a lot of friends that I would meet that had better cameras than I did. And they would just like, let me use their, their gear. And wow. that really helped excel my, my talent. Um, and I don't know, I, I just feel Tucson is just such a small, it's, it's a big, small community, you know, mm -hmm. or small, big, small, small, big, whatever, however you want to refer to it as, but um, yeah, just, uh, constant support i feel like we all just want to make it you know and i think tucson is a great place to do that so yeah i think just with the the information and just having such a beautiful like diverse um community really helps with that do you have any kind of tips for any up-and-comer type photographers that are just getting started um I would say patience, um, you know, really find your, your style, your craft. Um, don't judge your success on other people's. Um, I, I think that's something I wish I could take back um, or something I did differently, you know, starting out. I was like, I'm never gonna make it. This guy's way too good, blah, 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 you know, but I kept going and, you know, look where I'm at. Um, so find your style try to be unique um add your own twist to things you know that's what i love about art and creativity is you can put your own personal touch to anything and call it your own even if it's just like a changing the color balance of a certain photo like you know you can take the exact same photo as me but if you edit it differently and change the tones around it's a whole new whole different image and it might strike a whole different audience so um find something that's just you and and just be personal be um be approachable as well and just you know just be supportive of, of other people collaborate as much as you can um don't undersell don't give your work away for free um however to note on that um you know getting your stuff like to the news and stuff and getting your name out there is really great exposure in the beginning um but you know as soon as you make it big don't you know try not to do that as much um and yeah just just be patient and, and, and just keep going. Yeah. Those are really, really, really good tips um, for, for any up and comers. And I appreciate your time today and wanted to ask how listeners could connect with you and see more of your work. Okay. So yeah, I'm pretty active on all social media channels. Um, I'm on Facebook as Sean Parker photography. I'm on Instagram as Sean Parker photography. I'm on Twitter as Sean Parker photo. Um, and you know i i post on my personal adventure account probably the most because i like i just post whatever i want i don't have to worry about it being strictly photography related so if you want to follow my adventures and get to know me a little bit better um at sean parker adventures and my website is www.sean-parker.com uh, that's where i post my workshop schedule i have prints for sale um, some blogs here and there and yeah, I think that's pretty much it. That's awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time today. I think we both deserve a good lunch now that we talked about. Oh yeah. Delicious. <laughs> I'm going food. to Iceland. <laughs> there you, I know, me too. Let's go. Um, well, thanks again, Sean, and I will talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye guys. Thank you for listening today. This was a really insightful conversation with Sean Parker. 
The key lessons that stand out include, number one, taking risks. Sean pivoted from a full-time career in IT to an entrepreneurial journey into photography. As we discussed, this can be a big risk, but he followed his passion and taking this risk has paid off. He also agreed to opportunities he was not familiar with, like creating video for a major brand overseas. He sought guidance regarding pricing and legal agreements that helps to secure one of his favorite collaborative projects so far. Number two, education. Sean stated that the passion for education keeps your juices flowing. He was a self-taught photographer utilizing YouTube and trial and error. He said, I wish I took a workshop when I was learning because I would have saved a lot of time. But at the same time, I'm glad I went through those steps to be where I'm at. Today, he's teaching photographers who want to save time and shoot astrophotography. Visit his website at sean-parker.com to see his next workshops. And number three, sharing work on social media. Sean's frequent and consistent posting of his photography has led to amazing opportunities like shooting the Aurora Borealis in Iceland. He said, it all started with LG finding me on Instagram and saying, we like your work. Your vibrant and contrasting images would complement our new technology. Can we send you a TV and get your feedback on it? This led to that opportunity in Iceland. Doesn't this inspire you to level up your social game? We appreciate you listening to the Old Pueblo New Economy podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out all of our episodes and series at www.oldpuebloneweconomy.com. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter and receive upcoming episodes as they air. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.